All right, so let's, let's get back to the game. We're on lecture guide 11, which is grand manner painting in England and the US. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, as we work our way through the midterms, one of the things that I'll remind you of is that, of course, the context is important in all of these works of art. So at least giving a little nod to the context when you're writing your essays is an important thing to do, right? The context is what influences why the artists do the things that they do. Now, we're moving back in time, basically. Uh, we went through the Rococo period. This is kind of at the tail end of the Rococo period, we're going to move over to England, where I don't think we've been yet this quarter, and talk about the rise in England of the English Royal Academy, uh, and also reinvigorate your knowledge of the French Royal Academy that started almost a century before uh, the English, well, a little over a century before the English Royal Academy. So the context that I want you to be really familiar with is we're talking about a time period here in England and very shortly after this in France, which is what we get to pretty soon in a couple of lectures, in which classical aesthetics become very popular again. And they become popular first in England and then later on in France for slightly different reasons. So we'll focus here on England. In England, in the middle of, I mean, we're, basically we're in the middle of the 18th century, one of the things that's going on in the wider world that makes classical aesthetics interesting again, the classical world interesting again, just as it became interesting in the Italian Renaissance, are um, some very popular things. One is that Rome, uh, or parts of Rome, Herculaneum and Pompeii, which were these ancient Roman cities that were buried in ash when Mount Vesuvius and Etna uh, erupted, were very well preserved. And people had known that these, these cities were preserved. They had basically kind of stolen some of the antiquities out of this. But it's not until the middle of the 18th century that we see a systematic archaeological exploration of these sites. And by, by the way, when I mean preserved, I mean the, ma the volcanic eruption happened so quickly that it basically enshrined uh, the entire city, right? People were sitting at their dinner table kind of huddled together. So you got really good view of what Roman life was like. You got more, you know, Roman artifacts, a few more Roman paintings that we didn't have before. And this uh, creates a new renewed interest in Rome and by extension, of course, because Rome is drawing from or had been drawing from things that were Greek, the classical world in general. Uh, I know it's, I, I can't think of something that has happened in your own era that is quite like this, but in, when I was a kid, um, you know, King Tut's tomb, basically, all these artifacts went on exhibition all around the world. And King Tut's tomb, by the way, had been found at the beginning of the 20th century, so it's not like this was new stuff. But when it got sent out on exhibition, there was this huge craze in Egyptology. Everyone wanted to know another thing about Egypt. There were tons of movies that suddenly came out about Egypt. It got taught in the schools in a new way. We're talking about that kind of phenomena in the uh, 18th century. Dovetailing with that, there was a practice that was in place by basically um, the upper middle classes into the upper classes in which if you were going to school, or frankly, if you had just made your money, you would go on what was called the Grand Tour. The Grand Tour is a fancy term for basically for, let's say, adults. It would be them going on a very long extended vacation that had an educatory purpose to it. They would travel all around Europe, but the major destination points were places like Rome, and Athens in Greece, and you would visit all the old ruins, and you'd learn all these stories again, and it was almost compulsory. Like anyone who is anyone would go on the grand tour. They would talk about it. Who's, you know, when's your, when's your time to go on this? This filtered down to, to students. It's in a way 
kind of the first indication of what will later become travel abroad programs. At the end of your schooling, oftentimes students would be sent off on these grand tours for up to four years, by the way. These things could be quite long, but usually a year or two years. And again, stopping at these major, major classical destinations to learn about classical arts, classical literature, classical sciences, and so forth. So it's almost like a mini renaissance again after the period of the Baroque. And of course, during the Baroque, the, the ideas of the classical hadn't quite entirely disappeared anyway. So this gets people very, very interested in classical aesthetic, aesthetics again. <clears throat> in France, they're in the midst of the Rococo period, so it's going to take a moment until the classical comes back. But in England, they're not. In England, they're just kind of, I mean, I'm sorry, but England is not quite anywhere near the uh, cultural center that France is at this time. Paris is the destination that everyone wants to be in. Everyone wants to show their arts in the French Royal Academy Salon and so forth. And England's basically competing with France, so they decide, almost a century after France has, to start their own academic salon. And remember what these things are. The academic situation the English or British Royal Academy as it was known is a teaching mechanism for young students who can apprentice or basically intern with master artists to learn the aesthetic philosophy of art meaning what makes good art good art and we went through Poussin's four little rules to this remember it's got to have a grand subject it's got to have some kind of concept or moral lesson to it it's got to have the structure that we expect in classical works of art, meaning all those things I talked about in terms of Neoplatonism and perfect, ordered, both composition as well as bodies, as well as harmonious colors, all of that, right? Now comes along this guy, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who is the first president of the British Royal Academy or English Royal Academy. He says, yeah, let's just steal basically Poussin's ideas and simplify them a little bit. And you've got a reading by Sir Joshua Reynolds that basically says the way that great art was produced in Greece and then again in Rome and then again in the Renaissance epitomizes golden ages of art, which we've talked about before, right? This is when culture's at its apex. You can't get better than these moments. Sometimes something happens in the world and we fall away from the, you know, the heights of these moments and we have to climb our way back to them. And the way we climb our way back to them is we look at great artists from these periods. We look at their art. We model our art after theirs. Both in terms of its philosophy. This is what great art is. This is what the subject should be. This is how you represent it. And in terms of technique. You want to become a better painter? Look at someone like Raphael and emulate his style, is what he says. In other words, his huge philosophy for the English Royal Academy is just this. Art's already been perfected. If you want to be a great artist, go look at those great artists of the past and emulate them. Stand on the shoulders of giants. This is important to me because I think we get the idea that art has always been about creativity and originality and the imagination and so forth. Those are minor ideas at this time. Sure, they're there, but the big important thing is get to the style that's already been done. Do it again. A little bit different subject in your own hand, but that's what great art is. Right? So his, his rule is basically be a classicist, copy classicists. We're going we're gonna to compete with those French over there. The one difference between, or one big difference, I should say, between the English Royal Academy and the French Royal Academy at this time is that the French Royal Academy is much more closely associated with the French state, with the French monarchy. The French monarchy is constantly tinkering in what great art should be, choosing works for selection in the big salon or exhibitions, right? They're, they kind of hand their hand in that business. In England, they don't. In England, there's a hands-off idea. So even though the French, uh, I'm sorry, the English monarchs might say something 
about art of the time. They really don't have any power behind, uh, beyond the power of the, pul uh, you know, the bully pulpit. In other words, they can't go in and defund an artist or say, no, don't include that artist in an exhibition, which they did sometimes in France, right? So that's something worth noting. So J Sir Joshua Reynolds then, our first president of the English Royal Academy, you would think would follow his practice, but the truth of the matter is he wanted, and by the way, I should have said this right off the bat, the return to the classical style in England is literally called the grand manner style. So write it down. Grand manner just means neoclassical style, a new form of classicism. And he took that title because, of course, all great art in this classical style has to start, as Poussin said, with a grand subject. History painting in particular, which might not even be history, of course. It could be religious subjects. It could be Greek and Roman mythology, but it can also be history. He didn't do that so much in his own art because, well, frankly, it's not very lucrative. You can't make very much money off giant history paintings. They take forever to paint, and very few people have a place to put them. The most lucrative form of painting history, uh, historically has always been portraiture. So he did a lot of portraits, and this is one. This is Mrs. Sidon as the tragic muse. And it's a really simple one, like most portraits. What I always want you to be thinking about is how the artist, in combination with the person who sat for this work, the sitter, as we call it, the subject, how they get together, put their heads together, and say, this is what I want to present to the world. This is what I want people to know about me. Right? It's like any other portrait. It's like selfies today, frankly, except with an artist involved in this whole thing. And so portraits are always with a mind to how is the public going to receive this? And again, this isn't tough for you. You live in an age of media saturation. Images are everywhere, self-images everywhere. Just think about it. Before you post something, how many of you think, oh, how will this be received? How will people think about this? How many times in the past have you posted something thinking, this is how this is going to go down, this is going to be great, and then you're like, holy crap, didn't, didn't anticipate that one, right? A long tradition of thinking about how will this be perceived by the public, yet the root of all portraiture. In other words, portraits are ways that we represent ourselves to ourselves and to the world, but they are always inflected through our anticipation about how they will be received by that world. And that means the more we're aware of what the world wants from us or esteems from us, the better that probably pitch of the portrait is going to be. So in this case, what do you think Mrs. Sidon wants to emphasize about herself to the world? What is a muse? Yeah? Okay, minor goddess of art music. In the Greek times, there were sometimes up to 16 different muses of different things, but what do they really mean to us today? What do we say when so-and-so is my muse? Yeah? They're sources of inspiration. Sources of inspiration. So if she says, I am the tragic muse, what is she saying? Or just, I am the muse. I am a muse. Yeah. Like that she's so beautiful or great that she inspires people. Good. Two things together in this. I inspire other people, and how? With my beauty. And this fits quite in line with what the expectations and things that women were valued for in this society, doesn't it? We've seen this a lot of times. We saw it early on when we were reading Berger, and he said, men act, women appear. Women's value has been placed upon their appearance for ages. And here's another place where a woman basically internalizes that. I aspire to be someone else's inspiration to do something. I mean, I don't think many of you today would say, that's my aspiration, would you? As a woman, what I really want to do is inspire someone else to do something good. How many people think, that's yeah, that's top of my list, right? How many of you are like, I want to inspire someone else 
to do something good by my model of doing something good. Not by my looks, but by what I do in the world. Yeah? This isn't that time. This is a time in which women's, let's say, roles are limited, really limited. They don't work outside of the house if they're of the upper classes. And if they do, it's seen as a bad thing to be doing. Right? They don't aspire, or maybe many of them did, but they're not allowed access to the realms of science, medicine, much literature, painting. I mean, all of these things are foreclosed. And if society keeps telling you over and over again, what matters most about you is your appearance, how beautiful you are, which I don't think we've completely gotten away from in our own world, then of course you're going to internalize that and present yourself in that matter. Of course you're going to want to be even more beautiful. And it happens over and over and over again. I mean, when I show you one singular example in this class, I'm, I, I could have brought in probably a hundred of the same thing. And in this case, I could have brought in thousands of the same thing. This is just one more work by uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds called Lady Sarah Bunbury Sacrificing to the Three Graces. Now, on the one hand, he gets a little classical stuff in there. The classicism that's in here, or even in this, because she's the tragic muse. She's the muse for playwrights. She's the muse for actors. Of course, uh, you know, we think of the theater as beginning, drama as beginning, and certainly tragedy as beginning back with the Greeks. Here he gets in the classical tradition with some classical sculpture up here that he's copying, and with the idea of what the three graces are, which is kind of nothing. They're, they're a little bit of just the posse of Aphrodite or Venus. She's, they're just these three figures that are very beautiful, that hang out with her. They're just her buddies. They don't have any real purpose in, certainly by this time, in art other than to show you the female body from three slightly different vantage points so you can get a, you know, a butt shot, front shot, side shot, all in one picture. That's it. But here's the thing about this. She's sacrificing to the three graces. Why? What is Venus the goddess of by this time? Not the old messy Aphrodite of Greek times. She's all about beauty, isn't she? So this woman is saying, and again, apparently, Lady Sarah Bunbury was one of the most beautiful, sought-after women in the English court. She wants to be even more beautiful. So she's sacrificing to these, again, handmaidens of the goddess of beauty. That's what it's saying to everyone that women should aspire to. That's what it's saying to this little girl here waiting to become the woman who wants to be even more beautiful. These things don't just represent, of course, the societal views of their time. That's a part of it. They extend them, they prolong them, they pass them from generation to generation. So what happens if you're a woman artist? This is Angelica Kaufman and her work that's called Cornelia with her showing her uh, children as her treasures, or Cornelia, mother of the Gracchi, as it's also known. It may have a typo still in your lecture guide. I don't remember if I... For years, there was this typo that I kept missing that said, showing her daughters as her treasures. So they're not daughters. They're both, in this case, sons. In any case, let's go at this question. Remember what I said before. What are some of the things that get in your way if you're a woman artist? especially if you're a woman artist who is practicing in the classical tradition. Angelica Kaufman was born in Switzerland. She had a very, very um, liberal father who allowed her to pursue her interest in classical knowledge as well as classical arts. He even sent her to Rome, where she hung out in Rome during the height of the beginning of art history. Some of the most important figures who become the earliest art historians are hanging out in Rome at this time. Johann Winkelmann, Otto Mengs, names that will mean nothing to you, but if you were to go on into art history, they're like the forefathers of art history, who know everything there is to know about classicism, and she's buddies with them. She's hanging out with them. She's learning from them. Honestly, she probably knows a hell of a lot more about the traditions of classical art than someone like Sir Joshua Reynolds does. But she's a woman. And what gets in her way? 
Well, even in the most, let's say, liberal leaning areas, the idea that a woman would study from a nude male live model is something that, that everyone freaks out about. I mean, she probably did it. She probably got away with it from time to time, but she would have had to cover her tracks. She couldn't do it basically in public. This would all have to be hidden if she did it much at all. She may have even felt a little uncomfortable doing it herself, although there's no indication in her writings. She actually uh, kind of loves the fact that she's breaking some rules. Remember, if you don't get a study from the live new model, it's like tying a hand behind your back and say, do this thing that is so important to classicism, but, but I'm not going to allow you full access to the skills to do it. The other part of this, though, is a little bit trickier for me to tell you about. So um, help me if you've got better examples than I have. When artists who were women would paint classical subjects, they were oftentimes beaten up for choosing subjects that didn't align well with being a woman. So for instance, it was presumed that women, being the fairer sex, were not violent, didn't participate in war, weren't great leaders ever, and therefore those types of subjects were something they couldn't possibly have any insight on. Now think of this, if history painting is the paramount subject in the classical tradition. And if knowing anatomy is fundamental to creating the ideal figure, particularly a male nude, and everything here says that as a woman, you're not supposed to deal with that subject, you don't know anything about that subject, we won't even teach you that subject, and let's say you did get away with it, and you created the most amazing male nude. You created Michelangelo's David, but you were a woman, they would be like, ah, she's not a real woman, right? There's something wrong with her. I mean, it's a horrible situation to be in, and one that you have to negotiate your way around or bang your head against the wall for your entire life, right? And I'm bringing up two minor things. I could go on with this story for, for uh, long enough to bore the hell out of you, right? I might also add something here. For those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, and I'm not going to, listen man, I'm not going to start gnashing my teeth about this season, but I'm, I'm not exactly happy. I want you to notice something here. All the women, with the exception maybe, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, of Arya, have fit very nicely into feminine roles, including Daenerys, and I'm not going to do a spoiler for those of you who are waiting to watch this, but just think about this for a minute, what they did to that character and how nicely that fits into age-old stereotypes about women leaders, right? That's what we're having to deal with in a way earlier time in which those stereotypes are a heck of a lot more forceful than they are today. What do you do with that if you're a woman? You want to be a great artist. You know more than the male artists of your time, right? You've trained. You've got this game down, and yet it's like, oh, I know I could do that subject, but if I do that subject, people will be, and they did to her over and again. She doesn't know anything about the military. Why would she deal with that subject? She doesn't know anything about, you know, violence. Why would she deal with that subject? She clearly not, can't do it very well. And even if she got it right, they'd be like, well, she's not a real woman. It's quite a double bind. So what Angelica Kaufman did after a few, let's say, attempts to, to do things just on level playing terms is she figured out how to negotiate this. This is a perfect subject for a woman artist. The subject here is classical, right? So it starts with a classical subject. But it's not about violence. It's about moms. It's about paying homage to the woman behind the men. And she knows this will play perfectly because women know women, or at least society thinks that they do. They'll accept this subject. The subject is Cornelia is invited to her friend's house. And her friend, a fellow Roman, is showing off all of her gold and jewels. Look at what I've got. Look at how beautiful this is. Look at all of my treasures. 
And then she says, Cornelia, where are your treasures? And Cornelia, the perfect mother, did you guys all uh, say kind things to your moms yesterday? Yeah. No. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, well, not everyone's mom's perfect. In any case, here's what Cornelia does. She points to her children. She says, here's my treasures. Here's where I devote my time. This is where my interests lay. Right? Here they are. These treasures are Gaius Gracchus, over here, a political reformer, and Tiberius, who was a great leader, although we'll see later on, he did some pretty questionable things. But she's raising good children. That's the mom's ultimate role, right? That's woman's ultimate aspiration. We've got two of them. They're age old. Be beautiful and be a good nurturing mother to raise great future leaders. Yeah? I'm sure everyone can tell all of the other classical things here in terms of the stylistics, how it looks, right? So if you look at this face here of the nose that doesn't really have a bridge in it, that's classical Greek sculpture. They just copy that over and over again. You see the pyramidal form where everything goes up in the center and down on this side with a clear focal point, the white in the middle, that's really clear classical. The columns in the background, the subject itself, hopefully all these things are like, when I don't talk about them in class, hopefully you're like, yeah, I, he doesn't need to talk about them. We get it. We, we've done this. We see it. Um, this is, a, again, I just bring this in very, very briefly. Angelica Kaufman was a great writer, too. And for a while, uh, she toyed with the idea of being a poet rather than a painter. And this is her work called The Artist in the Character of Design. Remember, disegno is the, the most important aspect of classical aesthetics. Listening to the inspiration of lyric poetry. So in this case, what she's doing is saying, OK, well, I'm not going to be a poet, but I will be inspired by great poetry. There's been this, by the way, this really age old comparison and basically competition between painting and poetry. It goes back to Greek times that I'm not going to go into in this class that she's making a nod to. The real reason I bring this in is I remember the very first time I taught this class, and I wasn't, I wasn't thinking at all that this would be an interpretation. But I showed this work, and I talked about Angelica Kaufman, and I talked about some of the ways that she was bucking the system. And I think about 15% about of the class then interpreted what I was saying in relation to this picture as being Angelica Kaufman was a gay woman, that she was a lesbian. And I was like, whoa, where where'd that come from? And the reason is this kind of cozy relationship along with the idea that she's bucking the system is part of it. The other part of it, though, is think of it this way. How do we picture inspiration or a muse in classical arts? What is a muse always, as it is here? It's always a woman, isn't it? And it's almost always a beautiful young woman and there's almost always a little bit of sexual tension between that beautiful muse and the creator that is being inspired. In other words, it's gendered in terms of its basic symbolism. It's set up to presume that a muse will always be a woman who inspires a man. Now you get into trouble or you get this tension when you have a woman inspiring a woman... And people, I think, because it's unfamiliar, are like, well, yeah, maybe she's a lesbian, right? She wasn't. She was married a couple of times. She had a very well-known affair with a man you're going to meet in a little bit, Jean-Paul Marat, uh, who was the minister of propaganda in the French Revolution. But there's a whole other story here. <laughs> this isn't on your handout, I don't think, but I wanted to show it to you because... Um, it's a, a minor work in a way, and it's a work in which she basically thumbs her nose at the French Royal, or I'm sorry, the English Royal Academy and everyone who's her naysayer. Um, it's a work that's called Zeuxis Selecting His Models for Helen of Troy. And you, you won't know who Zeuxis is, I would, I would guess, but Zeuxis is a name that we know from Greek painting, but we don't have any of this man's paintings. He was uh, basically memorialized by Roman historians, but all the Greek paintings that were produced die, you know, were destroyed years and years and years ago. But it's, 
known that Zeuxis apparently painted this really beautiful picture of Helen of Troy. And Helen of Troy, of course, is the face that launched a thousand ships. She's the most beautiful woman ever to exist in all of this stuff. And of course, classicists would say that one of the ways that you create the perfect ideal and in particular woman, rather than using rational proportions and so forth, and you read about this, by the way, when you read one of the Durer readings, is that you select parts from different women that actually exist in the world. The idea being that there's no perfect Helen of Troy anymore in this world, but there are a lot of people who have a lot of really great features or parts that if you take that part and you put it with this part and that part, you can create the perfect woman. I know, it's a little hideous when I say it out loud, but nonetheless, that's what's going on here. Um, you, in other words, say, hey, you've got beautiful eyes. I'm going to use your eyes, but not your nose. I'm going to use your nose, though, but, mm, sorry, not your hair. I'm going to use your lips, but not your shoulders, right? You go around and you basically create this composite by taking all these beautiful women and picking their pieces and parts. And that's what you're witnessing here. Zeuxis is selecting all of the, from all of these beautiful women parts of them so as to create the classical ideal figure. The funny part about this is, you notice that this figure is the odd person out. You probably even notice that this figure is the artist herself. And while Zeuxis is otherwise, um, I don't know, interested in these figures, she's in here stealing his paintbrushes and his paints. <laughs> this is a big one. We're moving to look at the work of Sir Benjamin West. And Sir Benjamin West was actually born in the United States. He did a little bit of study here in the United States as an artist. And then he had higher aspirations, and he moved to England to get his training. And this is very, very common for artists in the United States. Um, in the United States at this time, we have no artistic schools. We have very few master artists at all, if you could even call them that. So if your ambition was to become a great artist, sculptor, painter, architect, whatever, you're not going to do it in the United States. You need to get out of the United States and go somewhere else. And because of the language barriers and also because of our close cultural ties to England, most American artists would go to England. A few would go to France. I think the more ambitious ones, frankly, actually went to France. But that's what Benjamin West did. And then after he goes to England and he uh, achieves great things in England, he will also be someone that a lot of American artists will go visit or go uh, you know, t learn under in England. He becomes their kind of watering hole. This is literally Benjamin West's masterpiece. Masterpiece was a term that used to be used in art to designate works of art that were created at the end of someone's schooling that were the masterwork that they showed the public to say, I am a master in my own right. That's what it literally me meant early on. Right? It's not just great works of art. It's a very particular work of art that you create, putting your best foot forward right after your schooling's done to say, I'm a master too. Look at what I've done. So artists spend a lot of time working this out and painting these works. The title of this one is Hideous, which is why you can be guaranteed that I'll ask you it on the final, so I can just kind of giggle up here while, while you're trying to struggle with this. It's called Agrippina Landing at Brundisium with the Ashes of Germanicus. I know, everyone groaned. You've got to be kidding me. I don't care about Brundisium, but I do care about Agrippina landing in, let's say, Rome or Italy with the ashes of Germanicus. So you just really need to remember two names, Agrippina and Germanicus. So here's how this works out. Benjamin West actually goes and consults a number of people about a proper subject for his own day and age. He says, you know, I know it's got to be classical, so it's got to come from ancient Rome or ancient Greece, right? It's got to be a history painting. But it's also got to have, and this is key to the grand manner, it's not only has to have a grand subject, it has to have a moral lesson to it. Its concept, the term that Poussin uses, in England means very clearly moral message. Teach the public something. 
And he consults a lot of people. He even consults the Archbishop of Canterbury, so religious leader, and says, what should I paint? And like most religious painters, he's like, you know what? There's too much sex going on in my culture. I want it gone. Pick a subject that's about uh, conjugal fidelity, meaning be faithful to the person that you've picked, your married partner. And so they work this out, and they're like, I know, the story of Germanicus. So here's the story for you. Um, how many people, uh, what the hell was that name of that show? Um, Gladiator with Russell Crowe a million years ago. If you've seen that, this is a composite of that. Uh, that was a composite of Germanicus. Germanicus was a great Roman general, hugely popular. So popular that it said that had he wanted to be emperor, he could have just asked. And he had legions on his side. The populace loved him. He was going to be picked. But guess what he wanted to do instead? He just wanted to go home and farm like Cincinnati before him. We'll get to him later on. In any case, the Roman uh, leader of the time, Tiberius, didn't believe this. So we think, historically, that Tiberius probably had him assassinated. Tiberius was that young child that you just saw, uh, you know, in Cornelia, Mother of the Gracchi. So he didn't do everything particularly well. In any case, Germanicus is assassinated. He was hugely popular. People are rightly angry about this. And his wife, Agrippina the Elder, is now an incredibly viable widow. The Romans don't care about whether you're a widow. The whole idea of, frankly, um, divorce is a big component of Roman society. So Basically, everyone wants to marry this woman. They figure if I marry her, she's rich, she's beautiful, she's got the support of everyone who was on Germanicus' side. This is a, a very, very important woman. The problem is that Agrippina doesn't want to marry any of them. She remains faithful to her husband even in his death. Conjugal fidelity. He's died but she's not going to be with anyone else. She remains faithful. That's our moral lesson. Now's where it gets really complicated. Another very important component of the grand manor style in England, and later on we'll see this show up in France, but it starts in England, is that English artists of this time basically copy or minorly adjust precedents from classical works of art. In other words, they'll copy little areas of classical works of art almost directly, believing that this is more truthful, more authentic. I call this their archaeological accuracy. So write that down, archaeological accuracy. And in this case, see the central grouping here, all gray? painted in grisaille, right, gray tones. That looks suspiciously like a passage of figures on the exterior of a famous Roman monument to Augustus known as the Arapacus, or the Arapacus Auguste. I don't care if you remember Arapacus, but if you want to, it's A-R-A-P-A-C-I-S. In other words, I want you to know this was lifted from a very, very important Roman monument. You need to know that. Where it's a sculptural frieze, meaning sculpture that's carved into the surface of marble, but that's not freestanding, of figures that were families. One of the big programs of Caesar Augustus was basically promoting family values, family unity. And so on this big monument to the peace that he brought, there are all these patrician families hand in hand with their children. And here's this artist who's like, ah, yeah, this is an ancient Roman idea too. I'm going to lift a sculptural group directly from that, minorly modify it, because I believe that if I'm more archaeologically accurate, this message of family values, of conjugal fidelity, will be more authentic as well. Further, in the background, you see these palaces back here? He didn't just make those up, as many artists before this had. During this age, there were a number of people out there that were 
basically visiting sites around Europe and Africa that had been used by the Romans or the Greeks and making drawings and then turning those drawings into engravings, prints. Remember, it's the craze of classical times, the grammar is in place, and a man by the name of Robert Adams was the most popular of all of these people. He traveled all over, he would make his drawings, he would turn these into prints, and you would basically buy a subscription to his prints where you would pay for, in advance, the next print that would come out six months later, and this is how he funded this mechanism. And these are his reconstructive drawings of the palaces of Diocletian at Spalatro. Again, how about you just remember this? Those are archaeologically accurate palaces from Roman times. Whether or not you remember their Diocletian's palaces is up to you. Again, not just making it up, trying to copy the classical world as, co as directly as you can using archaeological accuracy because you believe that will be a bearer of more truth than something that is just fictitious. Beyond that, you can probably tell, you know, very classical, central grouping in the center, kind of pyramidal form moving us in here, focus, foreground, middle ground, background, all of those things, right? Using all of those stylistics we're very familiar with. Now, the funny part about this whole story to me is, if you know a little bit more about Roman history, her um, children uh, are, are not the world's greatest people in the end. But she includes him there, or he includes him here on purpose. That's uh, Agrippina the Younger. Agrippina the Younger will grow up to be the mother of Nero, the guy who burns down Rome and goes a little crazy. And this child here, um, he must have been deeply traumatized by his father's death because that's Caligula. And I don't know if you know about Caligula yet, but if you're bored some night and you want to just do a Google search and find some weirdness, that's your man. So let's go over to the United States then. Or not the United States, North America at this time. This is a work that's called The Death of General Wolfe. It's also by Benjamin West. And it has to do with what are known everywhere but the United States as the Seven Years War. In the United States, we call these the French-Indian Wars. And some of you know this. This is the time period before the uh, revolution itself where um, basically Great Britain and France uh, pay various Native American groups off to help fight on their behalf as they attempt to colonize primarily the eastern seaboard of North America. So both sides are using Native Americans and so forth. General Wolfe was a famous British commander who uh, was in charge of the siege and eventual conquering of Quebec City. So that's what you're witnessing here. It's him dying, though, right at the moment that they have seized control of Quebec. So my question to you is, that's all you need to know right now for the subject matter. I would like to know from you, though, how does this work in what we have defined as the grand manner style? How does this work exemplify that style? Right? Let's start there. And then as you're looking at this, if something stand out that you're like, huh, that's kind of interesting. What's that all about? Make sure to jot down those notes and ask those questions. But take a couple minutes, turn to your neighbor, share your thoughts on how does this work seem to be a very good grand manner style example.
All right, so the subject is a grand subject, right? We've got a great battle, great general, death and a great war and all those things. But did anyone note what's different about this subject and every other grand subject that you've seen so far? I think I can say that fairly. Yeah. It's contemporary or roughly contemporary. Painted a little over 10 years after the event occurred, but it's not pitched way back there in history. And that's a big change, and that's going to be a big change that we see show up in the Romantic movement in France and a little bit lesser in England as well. So we got a, a little bit of a shift here going on. It's going to create some artistic issues for this artist, but I'm going to save those for a minute. So we've got a roughly contemporary subject, but you get how this follows in the line of other subjects that you've seen before. What's the moral lesson to this work? Yeah. Victory requires, sacrifice. Victory requires sacrifice or sacrifice for the state, right? Individual sacrifice for the betterment of our country. It's a standard type of, you know, morality that goes along with, um, well, with, you know, the military, frankly. And you still hear it today all the time, right? One man's sacrifice for the betterment of England, in other words. Good. So now take me through it piece by part. What's our focal point? Yep. General Wolf, how come? Okay, he's in the center. What else? Just shout it out. He's lit, right? Not lit drunk, but lit by light. Yes, what else? What's that? Sight lines, everyone's looking at him. So we've got implied lines all pointed towards him. He's at the base of that pyramidal construction, all of those things. Good. So we look at him and we notice something interesting, very important, death of a great man, but how are people's responses to death here? Is anyone like collapsing in a heap? No, it's a very rational response to death. Emotions are controlled. That's part of the classical tradition. We expect it. It's saying, we get it, it's sad. But this is a rational death anyway. He sacrificed himself, and we should respect that. So then, what else have you noticed about the the composition of this work? Places that things are placed. Does it look like a war scene? Not really. It's like, okay, everyone pause for a minute. Build a pyramid in the center. Some over here, some over there. Don't get in the way here, right? So we've got middle flanked by things on both sides, foreground, middle ground, background, and so forth. Yeah? All very common. We've got a couple of figures, though, that stand out here, it seems to me. Especially one. It's like the adoration of Christ. Okay. Right there, what does he look like? Lying down, a little bit of white cloth there, cutting his side. We've seen this before. Does this not look suspiciously like a deposition scene, bringing Christ down off of the cross? What do we call that when an artist, oh, I just used it, sorry, implies, allude. It's called an illusion, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. In other words, you don't specifically put a cross in there, but you're using all the visual mechanisms so that people will think, oh yeah, 
It's like it alludes to Christ's crucifixion, which, by the way, fits perfectly here. He's a martyr for his cause. He died or sacrificed himself for his cause. He's Christ-like in his cause. How about this figure here? What do we make of that? So we know Native Americans are involved in these battles. They fight on both sides. It just depends. This is a Mohawk warrior, by the way, our favorite. We love to put Mohawks in everything. We write books about Mohawks. How come? The Mohicans? They're cool hair. That's why. As far as I can tell, they had super cool hair. And we're like, wow, that's totally exotic. Let's use them in everything. Right? But why is he included here? What kind of... Uh, what role is he playing? Because he's not fighting. What is he doing? What does this mean? You see someone doing this. Besides, I'm really tired. Contemplation, thinking. What is he thinking on? What does all this mean, right? What does this sacrifice mean? Native Americans are going to be the topic of our next lecture, at least one part of it, uh, or American Indians, or, I mean, it would be preferable if I could call them by every tribe they actually went by, the Aboriginal people of North America. And the way that we thought of them and represented them is, has a hell of a lot more to do about us than it does about them, is the, the bottom line. And so we will see various stereotypical representations of Native Americans, some of which on their surface sound like, well, that's not that bad, all of which, though, have a very paternalistic attitude towards these people, treating them as inferior, lower on the evolutionary ladder than Westerners, and so forth. And this is one key stereotype. It's what's called the noble savage. And I, I'd be surprised if you hadn't heard this term before, of course. The noble savage contracts two things that would seem to be kind of exclusive. They are savages, right? Meaning they're not, they haven't been cultivated, they haven't been taught, they're not, I mean, what this really means is they're not educated by Western education and they're not Christian. They, they just think they don't have any religion, even though, of course, they have very rich spiritual traditions. Of course, they have their own forms of education as well. But this marks them as lower than us in the West. The other part of this, though, is that they're noble. Nobility means you're born into the world with an innate goodness. And if you put these two together, what you get is the idea that they have a kernel of goodness to them. They're just also savages who have not been taught the right way yet. And this sets up a situation in which we can claim superiority, steal their lands, create asymmetrical, basically, treaties with them, do all kinds of horrible things that just escalate by the early 1800s on the premises, on the grounds of, well, they need our help. They're just not, they're like children. What this allows you to do, too, is you can represent them in beautiful kind of magisterial ways, right? Really focus on all this body marking, cool tattoos, interesting clothing, all of those things that make them exotic, and still say something like, hmm, what he's thinking about is, wow, look at this example of the proper way to act. Look at the great man. Let me learn from the Westerner. By the way, there's nothing authentic about these body markings. Benjamin West made them all up, right? He's just like, oh, we'll make it Native American-like. So then the final thing. What do you think, and some of you know because you've done the reading, but what was the big controversy about this work when it was unveiled? What did people freak the hell out about? It's just going to be shocking to you if you haven't read this yet. You wouldn't even be able to guess. It's that they're wearing contemporary clothing. I know, and if you're like, what? Huge controversy. Before this time, all art has to be timeless, right? And I don't know what they mean by that, because, of course, it's always located in a time, but actually, I do know what they mean. What they mean is 
what should they be wearing? Well, they should be kind of semi-nude and wearing togas or something. That's timeless. Togas are timeless. Everyday clothing associated with a particular time period. And by the way, Benjamin West went and had his models put on the accurate clothing of the soldiers of this war because he wanted to be archaeologically correct, locates it too closely with a particular time, and therefore the moral thing is not really timeless, supposedly. In any case, it was such a controversy that Sir Joshua Reynolds publicly denounced this work, and King George III as well decided to stand up and say, this is horrible, how dare he put contemporary clothes on these figures, or something like that. It became so popular, though, with the public that about a year later, both of those men stood up and said, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Contemporary clothing is fine, as long as the moral lesson is universal. OK, I've got a question for you here. We're, we're turning to probably the most uh, important indigenous painter in, uh, in the 18th century. In, at this time, we're not even in the United States yet. This is colonial America. It's a man who worked primarily in Massachusetts by the name of John Singleton Copley. And if you go to Boston, everything's called Copley this, Copley that, right? This artist was almost exclusively self-trained. He did get a little bit of training from an artist who had trained in England. But he just had this incredible facility for copying what he could see. He was just really good at it, particularly drapery. And he became the biggest name in the United States doing portraiture, which is the only thing that American artists were doing at this time. We were not painting anything else in the 18th century. There's no other subject that had any viability whatsoever. Portrait after portrait after portrait, and he's the top of the portraitist. He paints this work, Mrs. Thomas Boylston, in a way that becomes very typical in the United States. It's incredibly naturalistic. Right, Very, very detailed. He shows her as she is. She's an older woman. If you get up close on her, you would be able to see she's got you know, a few whiskers here and there. He doesn't try to pretty up her wrinkles. He doesn't try to change the fact that she's old. It's not like Isabella Desta who says, I know I'm 70, but can you paint me like I'm 25? As a matter of fact, we tend to shy away from doing that in America. It tends to be too associated with elitism in Europe. So that you'll still get women, of course, asking for a portrait done in which you do a little bit of Photoshopping. But for the most part, these portraits are much more naturalistic than what you would get in Europe at the same time. And it just seems to be our uh, kind of Aller, uh, allergic response to the elitism we see in this and the putting on of airs in Europe. But with that being said, it still tells you a lot about this woman in other ways. Mrs. Thomas Boylston is what is known as a grand dame. It's just dame uh, with two M's in it, D-A-M-M-E usually. And what that means is these are the movers and shakers of the women in New England at the time, frankly, all over the eastern seaboard. They're the ones who are doing things like organizing community events, putting people into positions of power, organizing things having to do with religion. They're kind of the power that is almost invisible in society. If you want something done, you go to them and you ask them to help you out, right? And that shows here in a couple of ways. One is, unlike European portraits, she looks right back out at you. Right? Level gaze right back out at you. She's not looking demurely off to the side or up at the sky. She's looking at you. Number two, look at what she's wearing. Everything she's wearing is imported. Everything she's wearing is incredibly rich. So... She's got all of this lace. She's got all this satin, right? She's sitting in a giant Chippendale chair that would have had to be imported. She's in a, a room that couldn't have possibly existed at this time. Like, no one had houses that big with giant classical columns. But what she's telling you is, I've got tons of money, and that gives me power. There's another side to this, though. 
money in the United States or in colonial America was very closely tied to Protestant ways of thinking about money. And we made mention of this briefly before, but I'll bring it up again. Money became understood as a reward for fulfilling your everyday calling. So that if you're a good person, didn't need to I mean, you did need to be religious, but what I'm getting at is if you functioned well in society, if you had a really good job, if you were a good merchant, in particular in the United States, God would reward you with material wealth. And therefore, when you showed off some of that wealth, like, look at I've got killer clothes, I've got a great chair here, look at my house. You weren't just saying, you know, I got more money and power than you. You're saying, God likes me. And that's embedded in this work as well. So Copley does these types of portraits forever. And, and frankly, I think at a certain stage, he's like, well, there's a limited uh, you know, trajectory to this career. Um, maybe I should go to England. He starts sending letters to Sir Benjamin West. He sends him a painting. West says, yeah, I think you can do it here. Uh, just be aware of one thing. We do classicism here. And I don't think you know anything about classicism. But you show enough skill that I think we can catch you up. So he goes to England and... Um, Honestly, things don't go as well as, uh, as he had hoped. <laughs> so this is a, his famous or maybe infamous work called Watson and the Shark. If you grew up on the East Coast, you've probably seen this work because there's at least three copies in East Coast uh, museums. There's one in the National Gallery, there's one in the Met, and I forget where the other one is. But, you know, they're all over the place because he was so proud of it. And so he goes to England, he starts to do some portraits, tries to learn a little bit about classicism, but you know, he's way behind. Um, and in this case, what you're looking at is a portrait. It's actually a portrait of this guy, George Watson. <laughs> I know. So the way this goes is Watson, at this point, when he commissions this portrait, 30 ish years have passed from the moment that he wants depicted in the portrait. The moment he wants depicted in the portrait is when he was a young man. He um, was a, um, a lesser, I don't, I don't even know if I know what his role was, but he was working in Havana Harbor on a boat. I don't, I don't think he had, he wasn't a captain yet or anything like that. And he went for a swim and a shark came up and bit part of his leg off. And then he goes on in the next 30 years to become a captain of a boat, own a whole fleet of boats, have boatloads of money after all of that, you know. And he wants to point back to this earlier moment where he overcame adversity. So he seeks out this American artist who should know Havana Harbor a little bit better than others and says, hey, will you paint me? And Copley says, sure, no problem. And he's learned a little bit about classicism, right? So you get some of that, like, oh, pyramidal form. Everyone trying to help him, focal point and so forth. But he also has learned that the way that you represent figures, of course, who are heroic is to model them after famous heroic sculptures or paintings. And so he lifts this out of a famous sculpture and he just kind of photoshops it in there. So here's, you know, Watson leaning back. I don't know what the hell he's supposed to be doing. It's like, dude, turn over, do a little work in this, right? I'm lounging back here, looking like a classical nude, got our classicism in there. I would say from this part up, it's a good painting, right? Good scene of boats, good pyramidal composition, good figures in action, but not being too emotional. It just goes horribly wrong down here, and especially there. <laughs> Here's the thing. I mean, it's a no-brainer. If I say to you something like, well, Copley, you know, he can paint anything he can see. How many people think he probably has never seen a shark? <laughs> and can you, can you kind of intuit in this what he has seen of a shark? Right? If you haven't seen a shark firsthand, what is the one thing he got accurate? Kind of. He got the jawbone right, right? So, you know, the jawbone doesn't rot. It sticks around. It's the only kind of real part of a shark that's left after they die. And he probably had a few of those around. He's like, ah, I've got it. This is the most important part anyway. That's the part that takes the chomp out of George Watson. I'm just going to focus in on the jaw, and we'll hope everything else gets into place. No one told him the jaw goes underneath the skin, so it looks like our shark has lips here. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. 
So we're just going to finish up a couple of things on lecture guide number 11. There are a couple of works that I put in here that I put in about midway through the quarter. So if you downloaded all your lecture guides early on, I'll give you the names and dates of these last two works that are not on your lecture guide. This one is. We're on John Vanderlyn's work, um, Ariadne Asleep on the Island of Naxos. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. It's your typical female nude. We've seen these things before. What I wanted to use this work to talk to you about is uh, the context of the United States, or basically colonial uh, America and then United States, in relation to art forms, right? So I made mention last time we were looking at Copley that all the way through um, up to the revolution, you get very, very little in the way of various genres to the arts besides portraiture. That's just the main thing that's around. If people want something else, they oftentimes will go to Europe to pick it up. We don't have museums. We don't have galleries. We don't have master artists in the United States. No way to learn it. You've got to go to Europe to get these things. But a few artists did try to do that, especially right after the American Revolution. And one of them is John Vanderlyn, who actually went to France and studied under... Jean-Léon Jérôme, among other artists, so remember Jean-Léon Jérôme's Orientalism, <clears throat> and he, you know, learned and mastered to some degree the traditions and the, the subjects that were popular in Europe at the time, including this female nude. Um, and, you know, he actually, the subject here is Greek mythology. Again, Ariadne is the brains behind the Theseus and the Minotaur operation, if you've ever heard about that. Theseus leaves Athens to save, basically, Athenians from having to give people to this half-man, half-bull creature that lives beneath the palace of King Minos on Crete. Uh, and he destroys the Minotaur, who lives in a labyrinth, a maze, beneath the city, um, by stabbing him with his own horn. But the only way he can do this is that on his way in, the daughter of King Minos, Ariadne, who's become smitten with him, gives him a string so that he can unravel this on his way in and then follow it on his way back out. So he does his glorious deed. He's returning home to Athens triumphant to tell his father he's taken Ariadne with him. But for whatever reason, and of course these Greek myths are told a million different ways, he decides, uh, maybe uh, like your, your, your typical schlubby male, uh, that uh, after a night of lovemaking on the island of Naxos, he is going to leave her asleep and slink off in the morning hours home and just leave her ghosted on this island, right? Uh, it, it's, all of that's in here. Later on, by the way, she gets kind of saved by Bacchus, who shows up and marries her and so forth, and she gets a party life from that point forward. Um, but that's all ancillary to the actual subject. It's all a big excuse to show you a woman lying naked on a bed of grass so that you can look at her voyeuristically and all of the things that we've talked about with respect to the female nude. In Europe, this is standard fare. In Europe, this work wins awards at the academic salon, right? So he's feeling like, wow, I've made it. And he takes this work back to the United States, and he tries to put it on display, which means renting out a space, charging people admission to come see it, putting up flyers and so forth. Uh, and the public is outraged. And the reason they're outraged is that they don't have a context for this nudity. Right? They haven't, I mean, they know something about it. It happens in Europe and so forth. They've seen it, let's say, in Renaissance art and so forth. But they are rightly, um, you know, they're rightly thinking this is about eroticism. This is about that beautiful body. This is basically, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say pornography, but it's erotica. It's meant to turn you on. And they don't have those cover stories at the forefront of their mind that say, no, 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 it's not about that. It's all about beauty. It's all about God. It's all about these other things. In any case, it doesn't fly. They just won't accept it. The cover stories that, that exist in Europe don't work for this work. We'll come back to this work in a minute, but I want to give you a heads up that it's coming back at you. This is the work that John Vanderlyn creates that does fly, that does, uh, is very popular in the United States. It's a work called The Death or the Murder of Jane McRae. And again, I'll come back at this when we talk about Native American, uh, representations of Native American and the landscape in the 19th century. 
Strangely enough, or maybe not so strangely, this sculpture, um, which is created almost 20 years after uh, the work by John Vanderlyn, uh, actually does get a lot of popular and critical success. This is a work that, again, if you've printed out your lecture guide in the last couple of weeks, you've got this on your lecture guide. If you printed them out really early, you don't. It's a work by Hiram Powers. P-O-W-E-R-S, Hiram is H-I-R-A-M, and it's called The Greek Slave. Uh, and the date on this is 1843, although he started in 42. And it continues production through 1850. And the reason that this flies is, I mean, if you were to look at this without a context, I think you'd think, whoa, we've gone into some pretty weird territory. Now, not only do we have a nude woman, but we've got like some weird bondage thing going on. And I, I'm not sure that, that Coley is going to have a job after I tell my parents about this whole thing. Art history is taking a weird turn today. Um, and you wouldn't be quite entirely wrong until someone said, wait a minute, when this work was exhibited, Hiram Powers was very careful to have a very, very good context for this. And again, I like to call these cover stories or ways of framing your experience of this work that make it okay to show a woman without her clothes on. And that context was this. The context was, during this time period, Greece for years, uh, over a century, had been controlled by the Ottoman Empire, which was a Turkish empire ruled by Muslims. Uh, and at this moment, the Greeks were basically, with the help of a lot of other nations, uh, getting the Turks out of Greek. These are the, work, uh, the wars of liberation from the Ottoman Empire. On their way out, though, the, the Ottoman Empire did some pretty horrible things to the Greeks, including killing off a lot of defenseless people, um, taking women and children in particular into slavery. There's a lot of sex trafficking at, uh, at the time and so forth. This was international news, of course. It fit in a very particular context here in the United States to make this something people really cared about. First of all, all of course, the United States was founded on being kind of the next in line of these great early cultures, Greece because of the democracy in Greece and Rome because of a Republican Rome's two-house system which we adopted for our own uh, Congress, right? And, and of course, Greek at this time are Orthodox Christians and so we've othered the Muslims and these people are like us and they're the cradle of society. We care about these wars of independence and we care about the mistreatment of these people. It also, though, fits into the first kind of major rumblings around the abolitionist movement in the United States. So all the way from the, I mean, it had always been an issue, but especially in the 1820s forward, the question of whether it was appropriate for one person to own another person was more and more a matter of discussion. And this, you know, here you have slavery, not of people of color, by the way, which is probably why the way, reason why people cared about this. People could talk about this in the same breath that they were talking about whether it was appropriate to enslave people of color, and this was something that was, again, uh, a big subject at the time. So when he pitches this, I mean, imagine the controversy. Had, he, had it been like a black person on an auction block for crying out loud, it would have been something entirely different. But he puts a white woman on an auction block, chained up, and makes you think, as he puts it here, this is a, the subject is a Grecian maiden, made captive by Turks and exposed for sale in the bazaar of Constantinople. You know, all this exoticism. People are okay with it. Oh, that's what it is. This is a bad thing. You're not supposed to treat women this way. We're on board with that, right? But I want to ask you a just simple question. And this is, it doesn't matter what your gender is. Let's say you have been grabbed up Maybe your family's been killed. You've been stuck on an auction block. You're being sold into whatever kind of slavery it is. Things are looking bleak for you. How many people think you'd probably look like that? Anyone out there like, oh, yeah, I could handle that. No big deal. I can, I'm tough. No, I mean, the, the reality of the situation 
is not anywhere to be seen in the sculpture. The sculpture is about this beautiful idealized female body stuck in a position of submission. You, uh, the viewer, get to play the role of you know, being in, in the crowd, uh, either bidding on her, imagining uh, you know, all of her sexual misfortune, or frankly, even as many commentators have put it, saving her, being the romantic savior of the woman who uh, otherwise would be in dire straits, which of course will come with its own fantastical rewards and so forth. In any case, he sells the hell out of this thing. He sells 12 large-scale, full-scale uh, uh, sculptures of this and over 200 miniatures. And again, I just want to draw your attention to this. It's like, you know, people don't need to buy a sculpture like this to be reminded that it's a bad idea to take people into sexual slavery, right? You're buying this for a different reason. You're buying it because you're taking pleasure in the very thing that is being condemned. It's another one of those double articulations, right? It says one thing, oh, this is horrible, while at the same time offering you the very thing that it's saying is horrible. And you don't need me to convince you of this. If that, that little you know, brief synopsis wasn't enough, what you're looking at on the right-hand side, and by the way, when this work was exhibited in the famous 1850s um, <clears throat> Crystal Palace exhibition in, in London, they wouldn't allow uh, mixed couples in to see it at the same time. In other words, if you went in men and women together, they were like, you can't, you can't, this is... No, it's too erotic. We're not sure what guys will do after they see this to the women. I don't know what the hell they were thinking. And then later they decided, well, 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 that's too much of a problem. We'll just cover it from the back. So you could go and you could see it from the front, but you couldn't see her butt. Apparently her butt was like the most uh, you know, erotic part of this whole thing. What you're looking at over here is actually a stereoscopic image of this. Stereoscopes, these little contraptions where you shoot a picture of an object from two slightly different vantage points and then look at these two different vantage points through a stereoscope so as to make it more 3D. We're all the rage right now. That's erotica. That's what that is. That's like 3D. You're actually there seeing her tushy. You can do it in the privacy of your own home and so forth. So, you know, it's not me making it up. Um, I just, again, these, the, tri the attempt to import classicism to the United States basically fails over and over and over again. It doesn't really get going until the end of the 19th century. And I think with good reason. As I said before, we just see this stuff as elitist. We see this stuff as way too European. Um, this is George Washington, for crying out loud, right? And so you look at George Washington, and everyone's view, it's by Horatio Greenow, it's from eight, it was started in 1823, finished in 1841. This is a man who goes to Europe, again, does his training. He actually carves this in Europe and then brings it back to the United States thinking, and I, I get his logic, everyone wants us to heroize George Washington. He's our first original hero. I don't think I've said this before yet, but every single household had a little cameo image of George Washington. He was like the dude. So let's heroize him. This is what you would do if you're in Europe by turning him into basically a Greek or Roman god. Right? So why is he new to the waste? Why does George Washington, who God knows how old he's supposed to be here, um, look like he uh, has been hitting the gym for the last 30 years, right? Well, the answer is really simple. You all know it. He's idealized because he's godlike. That makes him good and true as well. I mean, the, the logic of classicism fits. It just doesn't fit in the United States where people don't know that logic, right? Before you take a class in art history and you're like, oh, that's what that means, it's pretty hard to figure out what the hell that anyone's doing here. Like, why is George Washington running around in a toga, for crying out loud? Um, so, you know, obviously doesn't fly 